time in Slovakia. Um, PyCon's brought me out here, and I want to talk to you about serverless. Now, you may have heard about this already. You may be wondering, how could it apply to you? And how could you get started? Well, I'm going to tell you how to go from zero to serverless in 60 seconds, anywhere, even on a Raspberry Pi. OK? Now, I'm here from the Open Faz project. And our tagline is serverless functions made simple. And that's what I'm going to do now. So to start off with, we need to go to the beginning and talk about serverless in the context of the industry right now. So we used to build these three-tier monolithic systems. Some of you might be working on those now. They're very large. They do many different tasks. They're hard to test. And they're very slow to deploy, maybe every six months. We broke those down into microservices with frameworks like Django and ExpressJS. But actually, with that came some other unique problems. Suddenly, we have all of these services that look different and they're kind of hard to manage. So tools like Docker and Kubernetes help us orchestrate those. Now, when you look at functions, they're actually the next step in that evolution. We're breaking our code down even further to smaller chunks of code that really just do one thing and do it really well. Once we deploy our function, we can pretty much forget about it. The system will manage them for us. And as more traffic comes in, it will be able to scale for that. So you think about things like Black Friday or a shopping day. Functions do not replace those existing patterns. Actually, they work perfectly when they combine them together. And so you may imagine that you have a Stripe payment gateway written as a big monolith. Well, perhaps you need to integrate with a new payment method. And you could write a function and deploy it, maybe take it to production within a day in whatever language makes sense for your business. So what we're talking about with serverless is really we're trying to focus on functions. Functions are short-lived. They don't expose any ports. There's no, not like Flask, port 5000, there's no ports. There's no state. So between the calls, you have to do everything you need to do. If you're storing data, you have to put it somewhere else, like an S3 bucket. And they're single-purposed. So that's why they can be so small, because they only have one job to do and have to do it really well. So for an example, um, let's look at where serverless fits in. This is the cloud native landscape. Has anybody seen this before? I've seen two people. So let me explain this. This is a collection of open source technologies that have been selected because they're relevant to the industry, they're well curated, and they're a good way to go. So you have things like Docker on here, Elasticsearch, and OpenFAS. But actually, it's still pretty hard to navigate this. And so I want to tell you about two serverless projects to help you on your serverless journey. And we're going to get up and running in 60 seconds. Now, if you thought that was big, serverless has become so popular that it actually has its own landscape now. And all of these projects are to do with the space functions, databases. We're trying to run things with less operations, less overhead on new developers, and more productivity. So we'll start off with Amazon's solution. So this is a nice contrast between the cloud and something more flexible like OpenFAS. Lambda functions are really well imagined with the Alexa device. That's a voice assistant. I have it just here. Got a red ring around it. Now, when I talk to that, my voice is uploaded to the cloud. It's parsed. The JSON goes into the function. You can see it calls out to a weather service. Now, that weather service is probably a monolith, maybe some old Java app by Yahoo. The result comes back, and then we get JSON again, and the device can speak it out. So I'll just show you how that works. Alexa, is it going to snow in Bratislava again? No snow is expected in Bratislava, Slovakia today. Well, that's good news. So I bought a really big coat. Um, so what, how does this actually work? Well, with Lambda, you write, a zip, you write your code, maybe in Python. You then need to use virtual env to install your dependencies into a directory. And then you zip it up, and you upload it to the cloud for a web form. They will then charge you per millisecond of invoking it, right? 
but you actually have to zip this thing up on your machine. There's no good way of testing it locally or in staging. If you have customers and you have an SLA, it's important to be able to deliver on that. Well, you can actually swap Lambda for OpenFAS and Docker and get all the benefits of containers. Now, the main selling point for containers is that whatever you write for, de for development on your laptop is exactly the same in staging, exactly the same in production. And so we can combine these ideas, and when you get to the limits of the cloud, you can actually go under the hood and tweak it and do whatever you need, use whatever programming language you want. Maybe you need to use I in Python. You just can't do that with the cloud. With OpenFAS, you can pick any language you want, any language that suits your team. You can run your functions for however long you need. And the other reason that it's really compelling is you can run them anywhere. So if you want to run them on Google's Kubernetes engine, you can. They will manage the servers for you, and you just write your code. If you want to run it on-premise, a university lab, you can do that too. And so that's what OpenFAS is about. Now, you may be thinking, well, what, what are the use cases? Is it all about weather? No. Machine learning is perfect to come home to PyCon. Think about libraries like Pandas and NumPy. Well, you can package them up really easily for machine learning, and you can bypass these limits that the cloud have. You can go 10 to 100 times bigger in your code base, in your model, than you can with something like Lambda. Batch jobs, a really effective way of processing data is by doing it when you have time or when it's necessary. So you may think about payments that are being processed overnight, the snake coding contest, again, that we're running here. That can be something that can be run later. So batch jobs can be done really easily with serverless. Image conversion. I'll show you an example in a moment of image conversion. Alexa is a great example of a mobile backend. And then chatbots. So um, we use a chatbot on OpenFAS where we can send messages to GitHub, and it runs a function. And he can delegate off fine-grained permissions so that we don't have to give everybody full right access. So they can add labels. They can help us run the project. And the last thing is that if you create a function, even Hello World, when you deploy it as a function, you'll get an HTTP API for free. Now, how quick is that compared to setting up a Django app or Ruby on Rails? So here's a bit about the story so far. I started off writing functions for Lambda, and I wanted to program the Alexa, and I found that you know, I had to write the zip file, and it didn't make sense. On my laptop, I'm used to CI and CD, where I can see Jenkins passing or Travis, and I can push it to the next environment. So I tried this out, and actually, it worked really well. I won the DockerCon Call Hacks contest and presented this in, um, at, Q at DockerCon. Since May, so this was about 12 months ago, it's gained 10,000 stars, has a huge community around it, one of our core contributors, Stefan, is in the audience at the front here. And we won an industry award from InfoWorld. And it's just grown and grown. And now I'm actually working on this full time, along with another couple of people out of Bulgaria. So OpenFAS wouldn't be where it is today if it didn't have a healthy, thriving community. These are some of the people that I'm really proud to show you here that have influenced the project and helped us build it. Up here, we have um, Stefan that I just mentioned. He's come here all the way from Romania. He's been helping us with Kubernetes. He's done a, a ton of work around that, far more than I could ever have done on my own. And there's other people here that have contributed in really um, unique ways too. So we're looking at around 2,000 commits since we began, 81 contributors, and a lot more activity on Slack. One of the things that we've been able to do from this big community is to mentor the next generation. So Finian and Ollie up here are both 17, and they had this great idea of turning black and white images to color using machine learning and Python. So they asked me, could we use OpenFAS? And we came up with ColorizeBot. This was showcased at DockerCon, and it was in Le Monde newspaper. Now, 
the reason I'm showing you this is think about where you were when you were 17. Could you, could you have done this with the tools that were available? I don't think I could have done. I was writing PHP scripts and designing a blog. Now, this is really easy for them to write their functions and deploy them and make use of things that other people have worked on already. Now, I want to tell you a bit about the architecture. OpenFAS is a Golang application. And up top, we have the API gateway. And this is where you can talk to OpenFAS. It's a RESTful API. Here, you will define your functions. They each get a root. That's how you can call them. Prometheus sits underneath that, and that tracks metrics of how many calls we've had, if we've got any failures. And we can use that for potentially your Black Friday traffic to scale the system up or down, depending on demand. Docker, Swarm, and Kubernetes allow us to take multiple machines and share that capacity. So the idea of serverless is that, yeah, nice clap up there, is that there's a less to worry about. You just add your servers into a cluster. Kubernetes will do pretty much everything for you. And then you can run your functions. Docker's image format is important here, because if you don't have that, you're back to the old days of writing it on your machine and hoping for the best. And we've learned as an industry that that's not the best way to do things. Now, OpenFAS is a community project. It has a composable architecture, which means we can run this anywhere on Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, or HashiCorp's Nomad. The reason we can do that is because everything on the left and on the right are agnostic of what's running underneath the hood. So you can change the engine really easily, and you don't have to touch your functions. That means you can move to different clouds, go from on-prem back into the cloud at any time. We have native integrations with Kubernetes. We've got Helm chart, really easy to get up and running. And we're just about to give you a demo of that. The other thing that I wanted to mention is this, this morning when I showed you the use cases about batch jobs, when I showed you the Colorize bot, sometimes it's really important that when you're dealing with events, you finish fast. If Stripe sends you a new payment request, you can't hold the connection open for a minute. You've got to respond really fast. Now, OpenFAS has a built-in execution method here where we can take your work in and say, OK, I accept that. And then later on, we'll process it and send a result back. Now, that means that you can build systems that can scale. And even if you don't have capacity to deal with it right now, you can take the work into a queue and do it later. You don't have to write that. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. It's built in. So one of the things that really makes OpenFAS stand out are the values of the project. And this has really guided the community. So when I say this is developer first, I'm, I'm talking to you guys. We've built a CLI and a UI for you to be able to get up and running and know exactly where you are. It's an unsurprising framework. So you can install it in one click. There's good documentation. We spend a lot of time making sure everything makes sense when you first come to it. If you're an ops guy, then this is portable. You can install it on whatever platform you want, and it's built with components that are already battle tested. Prometheus is really well known. Docker is a household name. And then we have this community-centric ethos. So developer love means that people will use OpenFAS, get to like it, and then they'll advocate for OpenFAS within their company, maybe spending their own time to do proof of concept. One of the guys out in Austin in America was doing that. Two hours a day, he went to work early to build a prototype to convince his boss. And that reminds me of when I first learned Python and machine learning, and I went and did that stuff at home and then showed my boss at work. And I don't know if that is familiar to any of you guys, but this is something we're seeing more and more. Is this a project for the community? Now, that's enough talking. Let's get into a demo. I've got an empty Kubernetes cluster here. And it's saying there's no pods, there's no containers. What I'm going to do is one command. And in less than 60 seconds, I've just created all the OpenFAS services 
They're live right now. So if I go over to a web browser and take a look, we see the API gateways come up. Now down the left-hand side, we'll have our functions. I'm going to open the function store and deploy a couple of functions. So we deploy an ASCII art for a bit of fun. Up here, we can type in the request just for testing the function. And then in the bottom half of the screen, we'll see the response when it comes back. That's now ready. And we see the ASCII art down there, this huge screen. We've got the amount of times it's been run and the Docker image name. Now, if you want to see something a bit more exciting, I can show you the colorization. This is a Python func function that I wrote together with Finian, who's 17 in the UK. The idea of this is we'll put in a URL of a black and white photo, and it will convert it to color, and we can download it. So this is one that I found earlier. I'm adding the URL and clicking download, because it's a binary file. And this is a great example of when you'd want to run something deferred or asynchronous, because it can take, it can take 7, 10, 12 seconds, depending on the image. That was 7 seconds. And now we've got a color image. That was done with Python. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's how fast you can get up and running. If you install Docker on your machine, you can run it in, in one step. If you install Kubernetes with Docker for Mac or Windows, again, 60 seconds, and you have OpenFAS. You've got the function store there. You can get started. Now, you may be wondering, how would I write my own function, Alex? It's great seeing these examples. Well, you do it a bit like this. You have a CLI called FAS CLI. With that, we can type new language Python or Python 3, whichever you like. And that will generate us a handler and a requirements text that will install any pip modules that are listed there. So in this example, you can see that I'm going off to a website. I'm doing a get, trying to find out what the status code is, and I'm printing it back. We'll then take this code and combine it with a Docker template for Python. And the reason we do that is because we don't want you to have to manage that. We've got a best practices one. So you don't have to learn Docker. If you don't know it, that's OK. You can just get the benefits of it instead. We'll then allow that image to be pushed up to the Docker Hub or a similar registry, and you can deploy it, just like I did on the function store. All of those were built this way and pushed to the store. Now, there are other languages that are supported too. It's not just the ones that are listed here, but these are the most popular. So you can write them in Golang, in Node.js. And last night at the meetup, Docker meetup, um, you guys should check it out in Bratislava. People ask me, can I use Haskell? Can I use Clojure? Can I use Rust? Well, yeah, you can build your own template if we don't have one for you. And then you can pull it in whenever you need it. This is why OpenFAS is a community project. It is an open platform. Now, we do have quite a few users now. And some of these are actually using Python and machine learning. I'm going to tell you about them. We also have some really good integrations with things like Microsoft's new managed Kubernetes service, AKS. So some people, when they see that OpenFAS runs on your own servers, they think, well, you know, is that as easy as Lambda? Well, if somebody else runs a cluster for you, you just say on the slider bar, here's my credit card. This is how many hosts I want. It's actually a very similar experience. And that's going to get better and better. Amazon just released their own. Um, managed Kubernetes service. And so because OpenFAS is native to Kubernetes, this application is very easy to run. And we're making it easier. So let's look at a couple of examples. Now, I don't know who heard about International Women's Day. We've got, we've got a lot to owe to um, those founding, um, founding minds. In particular, this is very timely from Anisha Kashavan. She's at the University of Washington. She's a postdoctorate. And she's doing neuroinformatics. That means she's taking images of brain scans 
And she's looking for things like tumours. She's looking at scans of hearts. She's looking for strokes. And what she'll do is analyse those using pandas, using NumPy, and all of these kind of modules, scikit-learn. Maybe you've heard of them. And then allows people to build this website where people like you and me, who know nothing about medical science, can actually draw around the lesion and she can crowdsource the data. So she's training these models using OpenFAS, and this could actually save millions of people's lives. This kind of work is really important. If you want to see her project, check out medjolino.com. And she's in our Slack community. So if you join Slack, you'll be able to talk to her directly. So Lucas Rosler is another example of a customer or a user. This is a real case study. He works for a company called Contiamo out of Berlin. They specialize on Jupyter notebooks, and they've built a platform where you can build a Jupyter notebook, and all of your functions are built with OpenFAS automatically and instantly, and you can share those with your team and with your customers. They'll be launching this in June, and they're going to open source all of the code. So if we have any Jupyter Notebook fans, go and check out what they're doing. It's very cool stuff. Now, the other thing about Lucas is he is a regular contributor. And this is a great thing about open source, is most people are kind of in it because they have a special interest. They want to get something out of it. Lucas is a great example of a contributor because he's added things that don't even help his company. And that is great. You know, that's what open source is really about, is improving the ecosystem for everybody. So look, here's my call to action for you. I want you to get involved with the project. Join our Slack community. I've actually put up a, and you can take a photo of this if you've got your smartphone, a QR code and a short URL. If you sign up to Slack today, you'll get in instantly. If you leave it, you'll have to write an email and ask to join. So please um, join our Slack community. We've got self-paced labs. They'll be running tomorrow on Sunday, actually. And we'll be taking OpenFAS from no knowledge to building a issue tracking bot with GitHub and Python. So if you signed up for that, please come along. If you haven't, there's a limited space. But you can take a photo of this, and you can get up and running with it anytime you want. Okay, And then. I'd like you to tweet to Faz Friday, hashtag Faz Friday, if you've taken any photos or you're interested in the project. We run this every week, and there's an opportunity to win a prize. So I'll pick somebody, and I'll send you some swag and a nice T-shirt, OK, and give you a special mention. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. And you can hear more about this at www.openfaz.com. So I think we have a few questions now. Thank you, Alex, for your talk. I will uh, read the questions for you because we have uh, several questions from Slido. So, uh, mono monoliths, microservices, functions, what's coming after functions? Can you repeat the last bit? Uh, what's coming after functions? After, after functions. <laughs> so that's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of energy around functions right now. I showed you that slide at the beginning of the serverless landscape. We're going to see more and more of these really complex technical problems like Docker containers and Kubernetes becoming so easy that you can just put a credit card in and click a slider, and, do, and that will be it. You'll still have to write your own code, but it'll be super easy, and you'll be able to get to production very fast. Uh, can you show an example code of a function? Yeah, I can, I can certainly do that. Um, what I can do is open the workshop. You guys should take a note of this URL. Feel free to take photos. And within this workshop, in the labs, it explains everything you need to do to build a function, to scaffold it, and we will see one just down here. 
That is your most basic function. And it looks a bit like if you write a console app and you have the main function. But instead of having to worry about that and setting up your TCP ports and importing libraries, it's all done for you. You just write a handler. In here, you'll get your request object from the API gateway. You process it, parse it as JSON, do whatever you want, and then return the values. So this is effectively hello world. This one is a bit more complex. This is finding out a random astronaut from space. So we're pulling in a JSON file from an API and then going over it in a random order and returning back one person's name from it. OK, so, so uh, what are some coolest uses of functions you have seen so far? Well, I guess we have seen that in presentation. Yeah, the, co <laughs> the coolest ones come up every day. Literally, yesterday I was standing with Stefan. We came to check out uh, the auditorium. And I had an email, Alex, I want to do 3D printing rendering with OpenFAS. And the reason you'd ask me that is because you can make any binary a function. It doesn't have to be in code. So this guy had a Docker image already. He had a binary in there that would convert a model into an STL file for 3D printing. And he heard about that asynchronous queuing. And he wanted to use that because he's got a bunch of files. And so I think every day we're seeing something new and something more exciting. All right. Uh, so uh, why Golang? Yeah, so Golang, has anybody here worked with Golang, tried it out? Yeah, about 2% of the people here. It's something that you should all go and try. And with something like OpenFAS, you can generate a Golang function, and it will look as simple as this. You don't have to learn Docker. You don't have to learn it in detail. You can actually just get started really fast. It's got a lot of stuff built into it for HTTP, for JSON, for parsing. You can build really responsive backends for your customers and clients, and just know that they're dependable. And it has a great ecosystem. All right, so I think we are running out of the time. So okay. I'm sure Alex will be hanging out uh, more. So if you are interested, please talk to him. And we will have a short five-minute break for the next pe speaker to prepare. Thank yeah. you very much, Alex. If anyone wants to ask a question in person, I know it's a bit intimidating in the auditorium, come down and you'll get a sticker. You'll get a magnet. All right? <laughs> Thanks. OK, thank you, Alex.